Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Japanese Literature and Culture Before 1600. I'm your much aggrieved teacher and guide on this terrible journey. Sorry, I've had to record this video several times now because of stupid mistakes that I have made. So if I'm a little irritated or agitated throughout the video, it's nothing to do with you guys. It's I'm mad at myself. It happens. All right. So moving on, we're going to be talking about our less good buddy, although, you know, okay, I took a dump on Kamano Chome, and I got to scroll back up because... <laughs> so in the Kenko video, I mentioned that um, Kamano Chome is not my favorite individual on the planet, but he's still no less worth talking about, and he's interesting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, to begin with, once again, we have another writer in this period, like um, Lady Nijol, and I mean, pretty much, I mean, we've seen this pattern over and over again. We've seen people who are sort of like fallen from grace in some way, like reduced status, or in one way or another, sort of like began their lives in a much better place than they ended them. And the awareness of that fact informs their writing very deeply, and Cholme is no different from this. And what's interesting is that um, in your reading for today, he actually gives an account of this briefly. I mean, he doesn't go into too much detail. So on page 319, he says, I inherited my paternal grandmother's house and occupied it for some time. Then I lost my backing, and the footnote explains this. So let's take a look at this real quick. It says, Chome is probably referring to the death of his father. In 1172 or 1173. I thought the date for this was 1170. Hmm. So in my notes, it says 1170 because that's what it was in in my notes for some reason. Maybe I'm wrong. The, your text has it as, so it's either 1170, 1172, or 1173. Who knows? But at some point in the, 11, in the early 1170s, his dad died. And so he says, came down in the world, and even though the house was full of fond memories, that was his paternal grandmother's house, I finally could live there no longer. And so I, past the age of 30, resolved to build a hut. And this hut is going to be very important. It's not only sort of the subject of the, the text that we're going to be looking at, um, but it's also um, a fairly clear metaphor for the spiritual condition of the individual, um, not only Cholme himself, but also like also in the way in which he is kind of representative of the society in which of the people of the society in which he lives. So I'm going to add to this. Well, first of all, it should be he died. You know, uh, today's just riddled with errors. You guys are going to have to forgive me. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> so we're going to say or 1172 or 1173. Who knows when it was? Anyway, the point is that so Chome came from the family that was responsible for managing and running the the Kamo, well, one of the Kamo shrines. There's a there's an upper and a lower Kamo shrine. But what's interesting is that when his father died, either in 1170 or 1172 or 1173, anyway, when his father died at some point in the 1170s, so Chome had the expectation that he was going to be elevated to his father's rank and to his father's position. And he was essentially going to like, you know, take over the family business, but that didn't happen. Not at all. And so on the one hand, you have Chome's like fall from, not really from grace, but he had certain expectations about how his life was supposed to play out. And so there was like his personal circumstances kind of falling apart while at the same time, like, regardless of what year it actually was, the, the early 1170s are, you know, in the dead center of that that 30 year period in which the, the Taira and the Minamoto are sort of struggling with each other constantly for power. And the, the old like order of the Heian period is kind of falling apart. So we have this decline of the, the Heian era. We have sort of the, the new world that is that is rising, but you know, in between the sort of the instantiation of the Kamakura Shogunate and the complete collapse of the, the you know, the Han system as such as it was, there was this period where like no one really knew what was going on, what was going to happen. And there was a sense that like everything was falling apart, but also there was no sense of what was going to replace it. And then that was the world in which Chome like 
essentially came of age. Like that's when he sort of came into the very moment when he was supposed to like become an independent like adult, his his own person, his own man. That was also at the same time. That was the exact same time that everything else was also falling apart. So to reflect this this condition, both sort of like a social condition and a personal condition. And in fact, it's it's important to note that we have both. We have both we have the society and we so we have the social and we have the personal and in Chome's text these two will always reflect each other so bear that in mind so the title of the text whole jokey is kind of impossible to translate i mean i have a literal translation here like these the square joel record um so the the key here that character is the same as the key in like kojiki and um all the various other like chronicle type literature so there is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek thing going on in here because it's like it's the chronicle of a, of a room essentially like the chronicle of a room because the the whole joel is a sort of a squared and then uh joel here is a unit of measurement equivalent to 10 shaku shaku is um approximately a foot like an english foot and so that's why um, this title is often translated into English as like an, the the account of a ten foot hut, because the 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 whole Joel is sort of like the squared Joel, so it's a it's a square thing that is ten feet on each side. And so, but the the important thing to note about that is that this is roughly the dimension of like a monastic cell. So this is a this is a room this is this is an entire domicile but it is an entire house an entire dwelling that is basically the size of a room that a monk would occupy so that's important to bear in mind so it's like taking that taking that sort of, but he's not going to live in a monastery he's going to sort of live in seclusion and sort of when it says so when the title says that this is the the chronicle of that that hut of that room um, it's both sort of the chronicle of the actual physical dwelling itself. So again, the, the, the sort of the social aspect, but it's also the chronicle of sort of the, the spiritual condition of someone who would live in such a hut. So the personal, again, the social and the personal. Um, and we can see this really from the get-go in the text. So in the very beginnings, so this is on page 313 of your reading. All right, he says at the, the outset, the current of the flowing river does not cease, and yet the water is not the same water as before. The foam that floats on stagnant ponds, now vanishing, now forming, never stays the same for long. So too is it with the people and the dwellings of the world. Okay, so we have the sort of famous opening lines of this text about, you know, where there's this kind of dial, as I noted, something that I noted when talking about Kenko is sort of like this dialectic relationship between things that seem to be contradictory. So we have like, you know, the permanence of the river, so a constant thing, the river does not cease, it always seems to be there, and yet the water is not the same water as before, so it's constantly changing. So again, we have like the constancy of change, this ironic condition in which we live. The foam that floats on stagnant pools now vanishing, now forming. It's like it's constantly emerging. And so strangely enough, the foam is always there, but it's always there because of this constant reemergence and disappearance, reemergence and disappearance. And then actually what I think is the most important part of this opening bit is actually this sentence right here. So too is it with the people and dwellings of the world. Because again, it emphasizes that sort of relationship between sort of the social condition of people and their personal situation. So on the one hand, you have the people, you have the people themselves, but then you also have their dwellings of the world. So like their place in the world and who they are as individuals. So this idea of like sort of like the constancy of impermanence, the constancy of change is just the same for someone's place in the world as it is for the individual themselves. And that's why I think this sentence is really an important addition because in many ways, what Chome is saying at the beginning of this text wouldn't really be out of place in you know, that earlier Heian period aesthetic. So just like Kenko, he's, he's sort of retrospectively using this old aesthetic, but he's looking at it in a fundamentally different way. In other words, instead of just saying that like, you know, 
we were talking about like mono no aware or sort of like that that the, the beauty in transience uh, in impermanence like that was sort of like the individual observing natural phenomenon and those natural phenomenon having an effect on the individual and suddenly realizing oh ooh, ah e ooh. but what chome is saying is that that condition exists in us in ourselves as well as in our place in the world and so that's where it sort of has evolved from the earlier Heian aesthetic. It's not quite the same thing. We we sort of we haven't moved past it, but we sort of like so sort of like if the if the Heian aesthetic got us to here, now Chome is trying to bring us to here. He's trying to he's making it much more about sort of an intimate relationship with the self and understanding of the self than those earlier Heian writers really would have been comfortable with. So to go back to our, our outline for, for a moment, yeah, like I said, we have this sort of ironic juxtaposition of the temporary and the permanent, but there's a way in which he also sort of moves this condition from sort of like a general idea, like the concept of like constancy and impermanence. He extends that to the capital and sort of this description that, of the capital that you get at the beginning of the text, then to society, then to individual people. And he says, so, you know, he talks about, you know, the sort of the buildings in the capital here. He talks about them here. And then, uh, where is this? Oh, will you die in the morning? Oh, yeah. So when he gets to people, he says, one will die in the morning and another will be born in the evening. Such is the way of the world. In other words, just like, I mean, he literally says, such is the way of the world. And in this, we are like the foam on the water. So like, dying in the morning, birth in the evening. And again, that's analogous to what he, so he's bringing it back to this image and not just like saying like, oh, we're like that foam, but he also talks about people in the same way that he talks about that foam on the water. Now vanishing, now forming. So die in the morning, die in the evening. So again, now vanishing, now forming. So there's a nice sort of parallel between sort of the appreciation of natural phenomenon that would have been indicative of a Heian aesthetic. Now in this later med medieval aesthetic, as some call it, there's equally an appreciation for how like that transience you see in the world also sorry, in nature reflects sort of a kind of fundamental feeling of transience in ourselves as people in the world. And in addition to that, what's interesting about sort of the, okay, so this text proclaims to be an account of a room, of a building, but Chome actually begins by talking about a number of historical disasters. And what's interesting about the description of these disasters is how they, they describe a kind of clearing away like, like things are it's not just that things are destroyed but it's also sort of like all of the old gets cleared out and you can see this in the description of the the whirlwind on 314. he says then in the fourth month of jisho 4 1180 and i will come back to that year 1180 in a second a great whirlwind arose near the intersection of nakanomikado and kyogoku and raged as far as the rokujo district because it blew savagely for three or four blocks not a single house within them large or small not a single one every again think about like what honen said about the human condition we're all broken people now here chome is applying this to society into sort of the, the material world in which we live, not a single house within them, large or small, escaped destruction. Some were flattened, some were reduced to nothing more than posts and beams. Blowing gates away, the wind carried them four or five blocks and set them down. Blowing fences away, it joined neighboring properties into one. Interesting. Now, th th this is what I was, so that, th here's the importance of this clearing. It's that sort of like, the way in which sort of people had like compartmentalized themselves and separate, like their, the way their dwellings had kind of like been segmented off and separated from one another. What Chome is implying here is that sort of like by all of these like fences and like gates and so forth being destroyed, like all of these adjoining properties, all these dwellings now become one dwelling. Now become the condition that we all live in rather than sort of our own specific houses, our own specific ways of being. 
Naturally, all the possessions inside these houses were lifted into the sky, while cypress bark, boards, and other roofing material materials mingled in the wind like winter leaves. There's sort of this beautiful image. Like, even though there's destruction, the whirlwind is like... In fact, in many ways, he's using a kind of poetic expression here. He's saying it's, you know, you guys have all read Waka. You've read these poems. You, you recall how like leaves in winter are described. Like the, the destructive force of this whirlwind is it's blowing all this stuff about. It's just like that poetic image that you're all familiar with. The whirlwind blew up dust as thick as smoke so that nothing could be seen, and its dreadful roar, no voices could be heard. One felt that even the winds of retribution in hell could be no worse than this. So there's, the, again, there's the sort of dialectic. There is both like the terribleness of it and the beauty of it. And what Chome is trying to emphasize is sort of like the way in which these two things are in like constant conflict with one another. This is very much not a Heian thing. For for them, really, it's it's sort of it's the beauty thing that you focus on. Like, yeah, sort of. There's a kind of beauty in transience and impermanence, but they would not have reveled in destruction in this way. They would not have described like something catastrophic in these sort of like beautiful poetic terms. It's just not something they would have done. And he says, whirlwinds often blow, but are they ever like this? This is sort of going on to 315. It was something extraordinary. One feared that it might be a portent. A portent of what? Again, recall this year, 1180. Now, I know I'm recording a video and none of you can, can answer me, but think about it for a second. Like what, what got underway in the year 1180? What did I talk about at the beginning of this unit <laughs> that started in 1180? Do, do, do. It was the Genpei War. So that that titanic climactic bat not battle war, so that five year war between the the Taira and the Minamoto clans that got underway in the exact same year, and so there's this implication that this natural phenomenon, this whirlwind that sort of destroyed all these dwellings and homes in the um, in the capital area, sort of <clears throat> foreshadows the sort of the great historical tumult. That will occur as a result of this like conflict between these two powerful families. Do, 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 do. So another disaster that um, Chome talks about, and this one is a little bit different. For, I mean, so when he talks about the famine on 316, then was it in the Yoa era? And so, I, again, we're sort of now like the, the Genpei War is well underway long ago. And so I do not remember well. The world suffered a two-year famine. Two years of famine. That's, whoa. And dreadful things occurred. Droughts in spring and summer, typhoons and floods in fall, adversities followed one after another, and none of the five grains in ri ripened. In vain, the soil was turned in the spring and crops planted in the summer, but lost was the excitement of autumn harvest and of the winter laying in. Consequently, people in the provinces abandoned their lands and wandered to other regions or forgot their houses and went to live in the mountains. Again, so he, he talks about the the importance of dwellings people abandoning the places where they live going to live somewhere else and so at this stage we haven't quite arrived at sort of like the spiritual reckoning that ultimately chome will want to talk will want to discuss in his own person in his own situation but he's describing how this kid like it's interesting that like chome doesn't be even though he's ultimately going to be talking about himself and his own dwelling and how, what that dwelling means about like the human condition he doesn't begin from that perspective. He doesn't begin from the personal. He begins from the social. He begins from the historical and then will move towards the personal. You know, Heian literature was like obsessed <laughs> with the person, was obsessed with like characters and their individual psychologies and so forth. Um, and, and like the things that people do, whereas and being in that society where he's talking about, it, it's almost like he's, he's beginning from like the widest possible view and then constraining it down until he'll ultimately talk about the individual, namely himself and his own situation. What's also interesting, he takes a bit of a swipe here <laughs> at esoteric Buddhism. He says, various royal prayers were initiated and extraordinary esoteric Buddhist rites were performed to no effect, whatever. So, you know, 
Cholme is writing, so you know, he's talking about historical events, but he's writing from the perspective of a time in which um, you know, Pure Land Buddhism is now ascendant. And he, so, I mean, the, it, it's a it's a bit crappy of him to be like, oh, esoteric Buddhism didn't, couldn't do anything about all that stuff. But in many ways, he's saying something similar to what Honen was saying in his more philosophical writings. Except the difference here is that whereas Honen talked about it more from like a generic, like I like perspective, you know, philosophical abstract way. Chome discusses these things from a much more historical and material perspective. In other words, I mean, he's saying functionally the same thing that like, you know, the, the old way of like of perfection, sort of the esoteric ritual practice, like doesn't, it just won't do anything anymore. And it won't do anything precisely because the material conditions in which people live has fun, have fundamentally changed. And they've changed so dramatically, like that this old way of doing things just doesn't work anymore. So again, that's that's not really all that different from Honen. The difference being that for Honen, it's more abstract and philosophical, whereas for Chome, it's more material and historical and ultimately personal as well. Because remember, his own personal life reflects this sort of deterioration, this fall from grace. Yeah, and that's basically what I say right there in my notes. So you can look at it yourselves. <laughs> all right, um, on page 318, He says, all in all, life in this world is difficult. The fragility and transience of our bodies and dwellings are indeed, as I have said. So again, the fragility and transience of our bodies and dwellings. There's the social condition and then there's the personal circumstances. These two things are united. <clears throat> we cannot reckon the many ways in which we trouble our hearts according to where we live and in obedience to our status. Again, this idea, sort of this old Han ideal of like the obsession with status, the obsession with place in society, we cannot recommend, we cannot reckon the many ways in which we trouble ourselves as a result of obsessing over all those things. He who is of trifling rank but lives near the gates of power cannot rejoice with abandon. However deep his happiness may be, and when his sorrow is keen, he does not wail aloud. Anxious about his every move, trembling with fear, no matter what he does, he is like a sparrow near a hawk's nest. So this idea of like this person who is kind of like of a middling condition, as he says, of, of, a, of a meager rank, of a trifling rank. So even though he's talking about these in abstract terms, he's in many ways talking about himself. He was himself a person of trifling rank. He was an aristocrat, but he was so far down the pecking order that like he was constantly troubled he was constantly worried about like what he would have to do next like how he how he would achieve things and he turned out to be right like that worry those worries were justified because when it came time for him to take over his father's position it was denied him and so what's interesting about this is so the way so I, i've noticed this sort of relationship between so there's like it's not just that like the the social condition and the personal condition are kind of mirrored of each other. In many ways, sort of the condition of the dwelling becomes a metaphor for the self. And it's important to note this because Chome's hut and the way he describes it will then become emblematic of his own shift in spiritual conditions. Like he becomes a better person as, a, or not a better person, but he becomes more, I don't know, I guess you could say he arms himself against these changing conditions in the world precisely by changing. So he changes himself by changing his social circumstances. Like two are linked. They're not just, they're not mirror relationships. They are, they are tied to each other. Um, and so then let's look, let's look at the hut itself. So we looked at a little bit of this. So he, he builds one, he builds one house that kind of completely falls apart. But this is the one that I want to focus on. He says, reaching the age of 60, when I seemed about to fade away like the dew, I constructed a new shelter for the remaining leaves of my life. I was like a traveler who builds a lodging for one night, for one night only, or like an aged silkworm spinning its cocoon. <clears throat> the result was less than a hundredth the size of the residence of my middle age. In the course of things, years have piled up and my residences have steadily shrunk. This one is like no ordinary house. 
In area, it is only 10 feet square. Again, the, the Joel. In height, less than seven feet. Because I do not choose a particular place to live, I do not acquire land on which to build. So you can just put this house anywhere. I lay a foundation, put up a simple makeshift roof, makeshift roof, and secure each joint with a latch. This is so that I can easily move the building if anything dissatisfies me. How much bother can it be to reconstruct it? It only it fills only two carts, and there's no expense beyond payment for the porters. So it's not just so it's not just that he's created a um, a hut that is sort of small and and humble. It's it's also portable, interestingly enough. And, and as he goes on to describe in the following page, like all of his possessions are built in such a way that they are easily portable as well. So um, the way he has kind of armed himself against the vicissitudes of life is by constructing a dwelling, he, literally constructing. It's not just a dwelling. It's not just a building. This is the thing that I, this is why I keep saying social circumstances, because it's not about the physical house. Like, no, that's wrong. It is about the physical house, but that physical house is a reflection of Chome trying to create for himself a social condition that he that is amenable to change. If his house is portable, if all of his stuff can move at the drop of a hat, if it doesn't matter if he owns a particular parcel of land it's built on, then no matter what happens, it's interesting. He can he, he achieves a kind of constancy, a kind of impermanence, oddly through simply like throwing himself whole hog into the idea of impermanence. In other words, he commits to change. He lets change become something that is part and parcel of his entire life. And what's kind of weirdly interesting about this is that it will get to a point where like in many ways he achieves a kind of stasis, a kind of stability in life precisely because of accepting change for what it is. And that's really what this, this whole bit is about. So then if we go a little bit further to page 320, we can see him in many ways talk about like the virtues of an unburdened life. He says, when I tire of recycling, actually, let, let, let me get to where this actually is in the text. 320. No, I think I actually haven't gone far enough. Sorry about this. Like I have conditions are not favorable for contemplating. And autumn, the voices. Okay, here it is at the bottom of the page. He says, when I tire of reciting, so he he mentions the the pure land. So I mean he's a pure land Buddhist, which is not really a surprise. But further down the page, he makes this really, really, really interesting statement. He says, when I tire of reciting the Buddha's name or lose interest in reading the sutras aloud, I rest as I please. I dawdle as I like. There is no one to stop me, no one before whom to feel ashamed. Although I've taken no vow of silence, I live alone and so surely can avoid committing transgressions of speech. In other words, the sorts of things that you're expected to do as a monk, the way you're supposed to live, for him, it's not difficult. Like, I mean, this is precisely the reason not to go live in a monastery. It's not difficult for him precisely because he has created in his in his habitat, in his dwelling, the not really the social conditions, in many ways the lack of social conditions, but the, the social circumstances in which he doesn't even have to think about those things. In other words, the way he lives day to day is a reflection of those religious and spiritual ideals that he is trying to model. And he achieves that not necessarily through this like forced discipline that you would see in sort of a monastic situation. He achieves that by sort of reshaping the world around him. And as I said, sort of giving himself over to impermanence. By, by sort of just allowing change and allowing these things to just become natural, to become part of his life, they cease to be real worries for him anymore. It's just the way he lives now. And what's interesting about that is that the sort of then the, this, this, like life is no longer a burden for him. In other words, he says, I dawdle as I like, I read it. It's like, I read the sutras as I like, I recite, you know, I recite the nembutsu as I like, I, I do what I want. And I don't have to feel shame about it. I feel fine. 
everything's kind of you know you know it's not amazing and it's not terrible but at the same time it's just like yeah it's fine yeah whatever yeah sure it's fine cool yeah that's the life he's created for himself it's an unburdened life he's sort of taking all those concerns all those cares for the world and all of the ways in which like status and the obsession with status like you know weigh you down and he's just gotten rid of them that too is a very anti Heian aesthetic because we saw this again and again and again in the literature of that earlier period. They were obsessed with status. They were constantly worried. They were constantly moping and being like, oh my God. Uh. But in this world in which like things really are terrible, like the world really is it really, it's like it does really seem like the times are out to get you. He actually has found a way to have a kind of ease and comfort, but that comfort only comes from kind of like divesting yourself of all of these these things that people are supposed to care about. And so, but what's interesting or perhaps a little ironic is he, and we see this on page 322. So in talking about this, this condition that he's created for himself, this sort of this very humble way of living, he says, when I came to this place, I thought that I would only stay for a short time. And we see this in the way he described the hut. The whole point of all of that was, you know, like it was, it was a temporary structure. It could be moved at any time. Like it didn't matter. Like I, I, I created, I created everything in such a way that like it was fine if my circumstances had to suddenly change. But what's ironic about that is he says, I thought I would stay only for a short time, but already five years have passed. Gradually, my temporary hut has come to feel like home. Think about that for a second. My temporary hut has come to feel like home as dead leaves lie deep on the eaves and the moss grows in the foundation. So what's interesting is that the thing that everybody is obsessing over, like all those people who are like obsessing over their status and having a position in society and stability and like becoming something. Ironically, Chome achieves all of that by giving it up. He achieves that sense of stability, that sense of place in the world by not obsessing over it, by in fact, like just setting it to one side, not caring about it anymore. And the moment he doesn't care about it anymore, oddly, he gets it. And then, so the last thing I want to leave you with today, it's not the end of your reading, but it's its its one of my favorite, like, again, Chome is not my favorite author, but I think this passage is really, really, really fantastic. <clears throat> he says, and it begins right here. Only a temporary hut is peaceful and free of worry. It may be small, but it has a bed on which to lie at night and a place in which to sit by day. In other words, it may be small, but it's enough. Nothing is lacking to shelter one person. The hermit crab prefers a small shell. This is because he knows himself. The osprey lives on rugged shores. The reason is that he fears people. I am like them. Knowing myself and knowing the world, again, sort of social circumstances, personal circumstances. Knowing myself and knowing the world, I have no ambitions. I do not strive. I simply seek tranquility and enjoy the absence of care. It is common practice in the world that people do not always build dwellings for themselves. Some might build for their wives and children, their relations and followers, some for their intimates and friends. Some might build for their masters or teachers, even for valuables, oxen, and houses. I now have built a hut for myself. I do not build for others. The reason is that given the state of the world now, again, this is like, we saw this in Honen as well, given the state of the world now and my own circumstances, there is neither anyone I should live with and look after, nor any dependable servant. Even if I had built a large place, whom would I shelter? Whom would I have to live in it? Now, the reason why I want to end on this passage and focus on it. Again, it's this idea that sort of the hut is a symbol of the self. And it's in this passage where it really sort of comes to head. And I want to stop the share for a second. I want to I want to talk to you guys full screen with my full face, my full hands waving around. 
what Chome is trying to bring to a close, not really a close here, but he's sort of trying to bring all these disparate threads together is that like when he says, I built a hut for myself and he talks about the hermit crab, the hermit crab is the way it is because it understands what it is. And so what he's saying implicitly by like building this hut for myself, I finally realized what I am. And that all of those giant estates, the court, all of that stuff that is built for others. And it's not just built for others in a literal sense, like built for them to live in and come live with me and visit me, but it's also built for them to see. It's it's that sort of that old Hayon notion of like, I, I display my status to other people, like through my possessions and through the things that I own and all of that stuff. And that obsession with like how other people see me and their opinions of me. And, but what Chome is trying to, I mean, he doesn't imply actually, he says it. And what he comes right out and says is that like, but by doing all of those things, you're not building a place for yourself. You're building a place for everyone else. And that when he came to create this, this you know, 10 foot square hut that has everything he needs, no more, no less. It was at that moment where he finally built something for himself to live in, for himself to dwell in. And so, you know, it, it, there is something sort of like deeply affecting about this because Chome is not just talking about some like general sense of like, oh, well, you know, you become an ascetic because it's a better form of Buddhism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, again, like he's not talking about it from Honen's perspective where it's sort of this abstract philosophical concept. I mean, it's related to that. And clearly like Chome knows of, of, of that sort of like philosophical tradition, but he's making it personal. And he's making it sort of circumstantial, historical material. He's making it about the way we live. We, you know, medieval Japanese people, we <laughs> live now in the, you know, what would it be, 12th century? Yeah, sorry, 13th century by that point. Like the times that we live in now, the conditions that we live in now, I finally figured out how to do it. And it's only by giving up all of those things that, that, that people obsess over that we can finally achieve what they actually want. And so that's what I want to leave you with for this week. Um, if you guys have any questions, as always, feel free to email me. Um, feel, feel, feel free to harass me in whatever way <laughs> you want to. I will respond as quickly and as completely as I can. So until next week, um, stay safe and take care of yourselves. Bye.